Welcome back. I'm the Zim. This is the Zim video. This is another Art Professors podcast right here on YouTube. And um, yeah, I'm not sure how long this one's going to be. Part of me feels like it could be a long one. Part of me feels like it could be a short one. I, I wrote down a bunch of things to talk about. Um, the first thing I want to talk about is if you feel like supporting the podcast, please do subscribe to the YouTube channel. Number one way to support. But otherwise, I still need this is come this is gonna kind of feeds into the overall idea of being moving to a new city or area and you know doing this journey as a kind of traveling uh, professor kind of vibe. One thing I know if when I move again, I will not be getting rid of everything because it's really difficult to have to buy everything. So if you want to help support this, there's things I have a wish list that's linked up in the description of this um, that goes to Amazon. I need like a vacuum cleaner. I need just a lot of just life stuff, but there's also a bunch of art stuff on there as well. One of the things which we'll probably talk about later in the podcast is like, I don't want to get too much stuff as well that I need to pack it all up. I want to be efficient about what I need and have. And one of the things that I, wish I had that I don't have is a giant whiteboard because I found that really helps me visualize my week and what's going on. So anyways, I don't have that on my wish list actually because I don't want to have to deal with it after. But um, yeah, so anyways, check it out. Support in all the ways. There's also Patreon and channel memberships um, on YouTube and lots of ways to support the stream and the channel and the podcast and everything we do here. So. Another way to support is to check out my Etsy shop. I reduced the price on all my original artwork to $100 a piece. So please go check it out. I'll describe a lot more about why I did that at the end of the podcast. But um, Etsy.com slash shop slash studio 1200. It's linked up in the description. You can get some original art by me for $100 or less off my Etsy shop. So check it out. Thanks. Please consider it. And uh, just a reminder as well, so I'm currently teaching at Northwest Missouri State University. Last year I taught at San Diego State University, got my MFA at San Diego State University, and got my undergrad at the University of Washington. I'm an art professor, and this is the Art Professors podcast, which includes you if you are also an art professor. So please um, give your ideas, thoughts, um, reactions to what I have to say, and um, see how it goes. All right, so... I have a few things. I have um, students and tech on here. I have uh, the uniform. We're going to revisit the uniform a little bit and update on the uniform idea that I talked about last week. Um, we also have, this is the end of week four. This is Friday, the end of week four. Next week will be week five. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Talk a little bit about my 10K goal for um, making more than what I'm just making for my job. I want to make 10K externally, and I've got a new, that's a, something that we're going to talk about a little bit. And then we're also going to talk about some personal work, including the Katanji Brown Jackson series and my plans for making work now. So let's get into it. I'm actually going to start, hmm, where should I start? I guess I'll just go down the list. So students and tech. Um, one of the things that I've experienced at this school and San Diego State University, and I've talked about this a little bit before, and I feel like there's still a little bit more to mention about it. It is the relationship, like basically what I've learned now is to really check in on where students are with tech because it's, it's very divergent, like across the board from my two experiences. Like, I feel like my San Diego State experience, the students tended to have their own stuff and they were attached to having their own stuff than relying on what the school provided. And at Northwest Missouri State, they tend to sort of felt like they were relying a little bit more on what the school provided. But now that we're a few weeks into it, they've been migrating to their own um, kind of uh, stuff. I guess it was just surprising to me how many students needed that prompt to buy the Adobe Creative Cloud kind of idea and do that. So maybe maybe it's my instigation of the situation is helping students kind of start to take kind of their own, um, I don't know, authority and going like, okay, 
I need this stuff. And it's just like, I just, you know, I hope that all institutions can provide that for their students a little bit more. Like San Diego State University, it all, like every student and faculty got the Adobe Creative Cloud for free. You know, it's just like every student in the entire university. Of course, it's like a much bigger university. Um, let's look up how many students are at San Diego State. So 35,000 <laughs> faculty and staff, 6,000. So that is basically 30,000 more than are at, San, at Northwest Missouri State University. So yeah, so when you have more students paying into a pool, obviously you can probably do more with it. So Northwest Missouri has to rely on maybe more subsidizing of you know ideas from state level stuff as well so yeah okay so we know that 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 seems to be pretty um reasonable to understand you know a smaller school may have less of an opportunity to uh, provide things to students uh, like the adobe creative cloud um yeah interesting interesting i don't know what i wanted to say about this i just think there's there's this is i just noticed there's an interesting relationship with technology between the two institutions that I've been at um, and how it plays with being in art school. I just think, I mean, I guess if, if I was designing my own art school, I would make sure every student understood no matter what program, I think understanding and having access to Adobe creative cloud type of software, uh, is valuable to every artist anymore. Um, it's not just the graphic designers. You know, it's like every artist, no matter what, if you're printmaking, you make, you know, you make your prints, you potentially make your your screens in the Adobe software, you know? If you're doing screen printing, I mean, if you're doing like other printing where you're actually drawing on the plates, that's a whole different thing. You don't need the technology, but there's so many opportunities if you're uh, art a painter and you're you like i paint and composite or draw and paint kind of ideas i composite my work on the adobe creative cloud software before i actually make it in real life you know i composite what i want to draw and paint and then so it's like there's so many opportunities so it's just like i just and i just assume i guess i just assume that students like students would be more like aware of the adobe creative cloud software like already like from it and especially if you're consider yourself a creative and artistic person it's like they should almost be like in you know fifth sixth grade start working with it in a way i mean i know there's a lot of like um different philosophies on when to introduce technologies to students i'm kind of more on the spectrum of don't hold back so much. It's like, this is their world. They're going to be a part of, they need to know it. And the other thing too, I've noticed and I've heard before as well is this concept that my generation, like generation X and even some older millennial type generations, because we were a part of the evolution of technology, it's a lot more, um, especially with computers. We were a part of no, like I was started school with basically no computers and then by the time now i'm in you know a graduate degree it's like where we are right now with computers but a lot of the gen z's like they started school with advanced technology so they didn't see the building blocks of what they got they're like do they all even understand what the icon is that we use on windows based machines especially but the icon or like word word um document you know, like microsoft word they use the icon of a floppy disk to represent you're saving your work but do they even know what that icon means because we don't even use floppy disk anymore so it's like to them it's just a shape that's like means save but they don't know the history of where it came from so and i could see there being a lot of other things like that with technology so it's like it can almost it's like the analogy that i think of a lot is jazz music you know, it's like, I feel like I missed, you know, I, I feel like I would have been a better musician if I started when like 
in the 1920s <laughs> or something because like the the where like jazz music was at that time was a different thing than what it is now like now you have to like it's so technical and advanced it's like it's no i mean it's there's still a lot of like soul involved in it but it's like it's so removed from where it started that it's more intimate potentially more intimidating or less accessible to a musician or someone and that that same kind of analogy i have for you know technology and potentially what students are going through it's like they're just expected to understand it without having lived through the evolution of it so how you explain it to the students is may need to change like maybe we as generation you know i'm not sure about boomers but definitely the um generation x and then older millennials like maybe we take for granted just the idea of technology so it feels like it should be more intuitive but when it's like everywhere it's kind of maybe it's taken for granted on a different way but you don't also understand the access point into it it's like yeah there's i don't know there's something about it and so what i would do i suppose if i was like building my own art school from the ground up would be like making a third foundations course it's like you have drawing you have i oh no, making a fourth foundations you have drawing you have 2d design you have 3d design your main three foundation courses and then you would have basic computer d literacy for artists you know and basically that's understanding the adobe creative cloud it's like basic you know photoshop illustrator basically photoshop and illustrator you could you could stop there but then you could branch out into maybe indesign or something else but um if you just understand how to use photoshop and understand how to use illustrator for every artist because every artist could use that technology in their work um and i've already heard some people kind of push aside the technology because they say things like, well, I'm not a graphic designer, so I don't need to know it. And it's like, no, <laughs> no, you should know, you should have a fluency in this as well, uh, because it'll help you with what you're doing now as well. So yeah, I don't know. I didn't expect me to go there with this conversation, but that's kind of where I'm at with um, thinking about this, this, the, where this, the current students I'm at, like thinking about their relationship with technology, what it feels like from my perspective, what I would do different. And I don't know what I would think about if I was in the institutional level about the relationship with technology and arts. Um, I think it's an important thing to think about, to have a conversation around the uniform. So <clears throat> the uniform is so basically the only thing I wanted to add about the uniform. So last week I talked to you about my uniform. I wear all black. I wear this Dickies outfit, which I would prefer to be Ben Davis, but Ben Davis are out of stock and more expensive. So I'm just working with Dickies right now, but I have this bomber jacket that I thought was going to be, I thought I would need to buy a new bomber jacket to fit the look, but the bomber jacket I already have works out fine and I'm going to keep it. So that's basically all I had to say there. <laughs> I just have this bomber jacket. That's going to keep, um, I wish my chair wasn't as squeaky, but we are in week four so week four of teaching my students god what's up with my chair it's all squeaky um i need to oil it um basically what i wanted to say about this was i'm finally feeling not 100 i'd say from a uh, like a scale of one to a hundred percent like how comfortable and confident am i feeling like last week 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 one was my i felt really good but I hadn't got into the lessons yet. Week one, I was like rocking. I felt really good. We did our culture building, getting to know each other. Still a little like apprehensive because I knew I hadn't taught. So I'd say I was in the like 75, 80% positive range. Week two, as I described to you, had a kind of a weird situation happen. You can go back. I think it's podcast number six. You can listen to that. Um, plus I didn't recognize that where the student levels were with my lessons, like it was like all over the place. I, my confidence level plummeted to probably about 30%. I was like, feel, I was like having a hard time week two, week three, feeling a little bit better. 
getting back in the rhythm of things. Um, and But I was still working on that understanding where the students were at, had to do a lot of work to readjust schedules and that. But now the end of the beginning to the end of week four, much more feeling confident about what I'm doing, the flow, the lesson plans, um, getting to know the students better, feeling like the students are interacting with me more. And they're like feeling, I feel like a lot of students are feeling more secure and confident in just talking with me and, and being casual and being like humans about just being humans in the same room together. It's not like they're quiet and intimidated by an authority figure or anything like that. I'm feeling much more like there's this confidence level of, you know, humanity being brought into it. And so I'm feeling a lot better. So I'm kind of up again, maybe around like the 80% mark of confidence, feeling good. Um, so that's where I'm at with week four. And I finally got something that going back to what I mentioned last week, which is the questions I would have asked um, had I known to ask it, uh, which is kind of from the student's perspective of like, what are the students expected to know at this point for these classes? Like, where do they sit? But then this last week, I had a meeting with one at the school about like the classes and what was kind of presented to me was understanding like how the classes I'm teaching fit into the overall kind of, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Ed, not educational, but like the kind of, uh, there's a word that would fit here perfectly, but the overarching kind of plan of the, of the school for how the, what, what order the students should take these classes and where they fit in that over overarching plan. And I was finally told that information, which I wish I was in. I can't tell if it was implied because I needed what I needed was what happened last week, which was like, this class is considered a beginning level class, which combined like is another version of this class. Like typography was kind of more like a beginner level class, which is considered, you know, you're still learning the tools kind of idea. So I was like, oh, I, I never had that kind of just very, very basic. So you're teaching typography, brand identity, you know, photo shot, you know, fo digital photo. Like I didn't have like the breakdown of where it fits in the educational plan for the students. That's a term I'm looking for. You probably know it. You're probably like, it's this, them. Um, but um and so i got that last week which made a lot more sense and if i had that like right out the gate i would have planned my classes different and probably would have alleviated a lot of stress so that's just adding to what i will ask whenever i have the opportunity to be in a new environment again and i'm giving classes i'll be like okay so i have this class where does it fit in the overall educational system that you have for what's supposed to, is it a beginning level? And then ask that question below it of, so how much can I teach concepts versus teaching a tool? You know, like that would be an interesting thing to know and think about. Um, and I finally got that last week. So it's actually, it's helped in you know, some ways, but I'm also into the semester already and we're just kind of rolling and kind of figuring it out as we go. But I think we've got a good rhythm. I think we got a good rhythm. One of my classes last night, we did a soft critique of some of their project and it was amazing. They, the students were communicative, talking, you know, they, they were like, it wasn't just crickets in the room while we we're trying to do it. So it was great. It was a great experience doing the soft critique um, in one of my classes. So hopefully it just continues on that path. And um, yeah, feeling pretty good, feeling pretty good. So with some goals, so I have, if those of you that are watching the video, again, reminder, you can just watch, you don't need to watch. This is a podcast, so you can just turn off the video if you have YouTube premium and just listen. But there's a blurry little blob in the background that I'm pointing at right now. And I finally put my chart up on the wall. And my goal between August 2023, which was last month, in August 2024, the first of August 2024, my goal is to make ten thousand dollars external to my salary at my job. Um, so that would mean selling artwork. That would mean freelance work of some kind, um, commissions of artwork, um, or 
like I do video editing, so freelance video editing, maybe it'd be some odd job thing. Like last year I, I hung a show in a gallery and so they, I got paid to do that. So it could be something like that. Um, there could be a lot of things that it falls under the you, what I make off YouTube and kind of Patreon and other support will play into that kind of, that thing. So we've actually finally um, got $300 toward that $10,000 goal. What I did was I made a grid of 10 by 10 grid. So each row, or each, yeah, each row represents a thousand dollars, and it's broken up into ten sections. So each section represents a hundred dollars, and then it goes up from there. So I'm gonna have a color coding system. So and it's basically like first come first serve, and what I have are available. But I'm gonna find some tape. I had some blue tape. So the first thing that's on there was blue will represent um, the freelance work. So I did a video editing job for three hundred dollars through freelance so that's going to be blue so every time blue shows up that means i'm doing kind of freelance work um the next thing i'm going to get in a couple days in about five days i'll get a deposit from youtube which will be about 200 dollars. and i think the next if i don't go to the store between now and then i have some black tape so black tape might be the youtube payments and then i think i'm going to make sure art sales are red tape uh, or something a red i'm going to make art sales red so we'll be able to see you know, graphically, visually, like where I was able to make different money throughout the year and how much it was visually through the chart. And hopefully by the end of the, I mean, hopefully way before, I mean, ideally, like at some point we will blow through our goal and we'll make another chart to just continue it on. But hopefully we can make that 10,000 goal way before 12 months from now, but we'll see what happens. Um, and one of those ways that that might happen is um, I'm starting to work on my personal work again, but I'm also starting to uh, try to find a buyer for my uh, Katanji Brown Jackson work. So what I've done up to this point, so a couple of things here. First off, we're starting to get my studio set up to make work and I might be making work this weekend. So I'm recording this on September 15th. I might be making my first work in the studio tonight, September 15th. Um, We'll see, or maybe tomorrow, the 16th. I do have some work after I record this podcast. I have a, a bunch of stuff to do for my classes, just to kind of fin you know, prep for that for next week and things. So I want to make sure that's in the bag before I do other stuff. But um, I got my studio almost set up. You'll see it on stream. If you're following me on other accounts, TikTok, Instagram, and those things, you've, you've seen pictures of the studio. So... You can definitely see it, but you'll be seeing it soon. I got plastic on the floor. I got some craft paper on the walls. I got two more walls to do. I have four, basically four um, canvases or like easels, I guess, wall easels, you could say. There's four spots on the walls that'll fit the large drawings that I like to do. And I'm just gonna run with the large drawings. I don't wanna think too much. Um, that's part of the process. It's like, you know, you can get caught up easily in thinking, overthinking about what kind of work you want to make and all that stuff and then you don't end up making work so i'm just like eh, i'm not gonna think i'm just gonna go with what i do and roll with it however i'm gonna change it a little bit because i'm not gonna when i do my live streams the live streams aren't gonna be specific to a piece of work the live stream is just gonna be studio time with zim turn on the camera and whatever happened to be working on that time and i'm not gonna expect myself to finish it within the live stream it's just gonna be like working for a few hours or whatever it might be the live stream will be going and I'll be working on some artwork and I'll be rotating between the four pieces. Maybe I'll work on multiple pieces at the same time, but I'm going to give a little more time to each piece because my ultimate goal is I think, I think what will help achieve the goals that I want, especially with like the social proof aspect of getting more followers and getting more people reacting to my work is to make the work more visually dynamic. So right now, I think they, I love my style, my drawing style. Like those of you that are watching the video, I have the Billie Eilish behind me. There's that, but I think it needs more. There needs to be something more, little, maybe more color, some visual dy dynamics to go along with it. Maybe like bring out a little more realism without getting too photorealism. Like I'm not into that. Um, but find ways to make the overall compositions more dynamic making them big is one thing like i've done a lot over the last year i did a lot of these 
sort of smaller drawings, the 18 by 18 profile pictures and the, you know, 18 by 24 kind of portraits. And they, you know, the size, just using black and white and just being kind of expressive with it doesn't maybe appeal to a broader audience. So if I can be more dynamic um, and I don't know, find ways to, and I think visually in my head, I feel like I have it. I just gotta make the work now. So we'll see what happens. So I'm gonna do that and I'm gonna do a combination of like, there's a large wall where I'm gonna have my, my kind of my work of meaning um, there. I'm gonna have a, a side wall that kind of accompanies that the main wall, but then I'm gonna have one of my side walls is gonna be my, what I'm gonna call my TikTok crush wall. So it's it's gonna be everything TikTok related will be on that wall. So I'll do a TikTok accounts um, that maybe don't have a necessarily a political slant to them or those kind of things, it's just like accounts I like to follow. So maybe I'll get some interest in what I'm doing just generally through TikTok from sharing kind of pop culture ideas with that. And I'm just gonna call it my TikTok crush wall. <laughs> so that's what's going on there. Um, so that's the goal. So hopefully, you know, I'll, I'll be making art soon and, or I will be making art soon and we'll have new artwork to share with you on all my outlets. You'll see it on YouTube. You'll see it on TikTok and Instagram, um, even Facebook, if you're, a, you know, you know me on Facebook, but so that's the goal there. So what we're also working on is trying to find an exhibition of some kind. Uh, maybe the work that I'm gonna be making soon, I'll make for an exhibition. I wanna do a exhibition related to my Katanji Brown Jackson series where I did 116 drawings of Katanji Brown Jackson. I have this idea I wanna do drawing the two Justins, Justin, Jeff, uh, Justin Pearson and Justin Jones from Tennessee and do another series of portraits based on the amount of votes that they were voted to kick them out of their 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 seats in their 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 house of representatives in Tennessee so it's like um, each one was basically 79 or so or 70 votes to kick them out something like that so doing 70 drawings of each one I don't have the um oh, I have the numbers right here in front of me but I haven't decided how I want to do that because I don't necessarily want to wait for an exhibition to do it in this gallery. So I'm going to start emailing gallery spaces around the Midwest here and see if they might host that idea. Maybe I can do it over Christmas break um, or something like that. And then I could do that during that time or I can just make the work and then try to find a gallery to show it. But I'll do the live stream of it. Maybe I'll over uh, over Christmas break, I'll do the live stream of it in my own studio and then the work will be done. But we'll see what happens there because that's a goal I have as well. Let me look up the, I have, I took a screen cap of the, okay, here it is. So Jones was 72 to 25 and Justin Pearson was 69 to 26 votes to uh, kick them out of to remove them from the body it says but I just think that'd be an, a good piece along the lines kind of match kind of in that theme of what I did with the Katanji Brown Jackson series which is the numbers represent the amount of portraits represent something significant about it um, so that's a goal the other thing I did which going back to the beginning which I might actually say at the beginning so maybe this will be a repeat i might go in and add a piece but anything that shows up on my etsy shop my art my original art any original art that i have on my etsy shop is be maxed at the cost of a hundred dollars a piece so there's a lot of individual pieces that are will be a hundred dollars or less um so there's a ton of pieces on there now that are a hundred dollars a good handful of them 100% of that money will be donated to Amnesty International. Everything else that has a donation aspect to it is 10% is donated to wherever it was. Like I've had a lot of pieces over the years that I've, don I've wanted to donate to various institutions. Lately, within the last couple of years, it's been Amnesty International is my primary space because human rights are important to me and I want to support that idea. And so I also want my artwork to give back to the society in, in that kind of way. So, I mean, hopefully eventually I'll be able to sell artwork for multiple thousands of dollars. So 
peeling off a couple thousands to go to donations is was the always the intention and goal but now since i'm only going to sell it for a hundred dollars you know i can't really justify um donating half of it because i still need to eat and that's not going to help me with any survival ability so 10 percent is the max for that amount that i'll donate so hopefully it'll happen and you're interested in buying some of my original artwork and you can go check out my etsy store if anything on that uh etsy store has over a thousand dollars like over a hundred dollars it means that's because each piece of a set is part and i want the set to stay together so i have my politic talk set that's twelve hundred dollars because there's 12 drawings I have my tunnel books, my baseball card tunnel books, which are ten thousand dollars because there's a hundred or a hundred tunnel books. Um, and I'm thinking about posting my Katanji Brown Jackson series on there, uh, which will be ten thousand or ten thousand five hundred because I have one hundred and five drawings left of the series, and they I want them to stay together. However, speaking of the Katanji Brown Jackson series, I've also been doing reaching out to institutions to hopefully buy it all right so what i've emailed to you for the katani brown jackson series i've emailed the civil rights museum national civil rights museum at the lorraine motel where martin luther king was assassinated so there's that one we have the civil and human rights um museum which is this one's in atlanta georgia we also have the museum of social justice which I believe is in Washington, D.C. No, no, I haven't. No, this one I haven't. Even, this is in California. I haven't. It looks like I haven't done that one yet. That's not one that I'm think it will be what I want, I'm looking for. Um, we also have the Museum National. This is the one that's in Washington. National Museum of African American History and Culture. Um, I emailed that one. It's at the Smithsonian, I believe. Um, and then I've also emailed a few just museums, straight up like modern art museums, including like the Whitney and other places. I don't remember all of them. I've gotten a response back from a couple of them, not to buy it or anything, but just to like, this is what you need to do to submit kind of your, this kind of idea. So I'll be changing like the Whitney needs an actual mailed in re you know, like request, I guess you could say. Um, so I have to fill that out, but some of them allow emails. And so we're just wait and see, maybe somebody will buy it. I'm listening. I'm told them in my kind of description of it, you know, I told them about the project. I told them about what I did. I told them that Katanji Brown Jackson has some of them. And I told them that also the letter Katanji Brown Jackson wrote to me would go to whoever bought it. So hopefully there's, you know, the, the combination of factors make it desirable enough that somebody wants it you know the fact that she has some of the drawings and hopefully you know i know my reputation i'm obviously i'm not a famous artist yet so it's like okay whatever you know but maybe because she has some and that she wrote a letter maybe it'll it'll pique the interest and like hmm maybe we do want these and and i'm willing to negotiate that price i i'm the ones that have asked for the price at this point i say twenty thousand dollars because essentially I was selling the originals for $200 a piece when I did the original exhibition. So it was like 200 times the amount of drawings that are left minus a couple bucks because why not round down just a little bit. So I just did $2,000. So, but obviously that's different than what I'm gonna list it for on my Etsy store if it, if it ends up on there, which it'll probably will. Cause basically the bottom line is with my artwork, I don't want it. I don't want to carry around this. I want to hopefully inspire people to want to support me as an artist and take the art off my hands, you know? And so I'm like, you know, it's been a couple of years. I've had a few of these pieces. I've been trying to sell them for thousands of dollars. Nobody cares. So let me lower the price to a hundred dollars and see if people will take them and get them off my hands. Cause I have enough work now. Let's say I sold out of all my work, you know, that would achieve my $10,000 goal easy. Um, I mean, obviously with some of the pieces are still $10,000, even with them being a hundred dollars per piece. But like, let's just so like half the work sold, um, that would get me to my $10,000 goal really quickly. And, you know, I have enough work now that it's like, okay, just get rid of it. Let's just go hundred dollars. Shouldn't be too much for people. Uh, that's the goal. All right, my friends, that's all I had to say. This is a decently length podcast, not the longest, not the shortest, or maybe it is the shortest at this point. 
but hopefully um if you have any questions for me any comments any ideas you want to add to this what you want me to talk about next podcast let me know um not getting any interaction yet definitely getting a few people listening to them so thank you very much for listening to the podcast i really appreciate it one last thing i'll mention i just got finished recording this behind the bearcat podcast uh i did right before i recorded this that one won't that's for my the institution i'm working at right now northwest missouri state university it was a really good podcast i can't wait to share it because i think it was fun to just have somebody ask questions to inspire this conversation a lot of it will be stuff you've already heard me talk about but just being in that format will be a little bit different so hopefully it inspires people to check out my youtube channel and other things and support the overall concept of what i'm doing but yeah um, so i'll let you know when that comes out but um as as per usual um, thanks for the support and as always be loving kind and patient and we'll talk to you again real soon peace my friends